Hi there. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about a new research project from R3 about upgrading the privacy of the Corda platform. Now, I want to start with a brief history of privacy on the blockchain, because it's important to put this work into context. Now, this whole story starts, of course, in 2009 with the release of Bitcoin by Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoin has a very simple privacy model. It starts by sending every financial transaction on the system to everyone, and it hides details by randomizing the names of the participants. In effect, names are replaced with randomly chosen, constantly changing public keys, which are just big random numbers, so you can't link them together. Now, this is okay. This is a good enough start, and Bitcoin gains adoption. Um, when used well, it is quite hard to link transactions together. Hard, but not impossible. For one, uh, there are still links between the transactions, and you can still see the amounts. Um, and another problem is that uh, software often doesn't use uh, the, this feature correctly, because it turns out that managing all of the keys and uh, you know, effectively always ensuring that keys are randomized in every situation is a quite a difficult logistical challenge. So this system ends up being nicer in theory than in practice. So not much really happens, I would say, until around 2013. A team from uh, a technical university in Israel comes to a Bitcoin conference and gives a presentation on zero-knowledge proofs. And they make some remarkable claims. They claim that you can take any uh, statement about a thing, uh, like, for example, you could say this financial traction is valid and follows the rules of the system, and you can, cre you can create a mathematical proof of it, but you don't have to reveal the underlying information. So you can reveal uh, that you know something without revealing everything about what you know. And uh, this has obvious privacy applications to uh, blockchain systems, but it has some practical issues. The performance is low. It's very new mathematics that very few people understand. Um, it has uh, a setup procedure in which developers can uh, create a backdoor into the system. The people who set it up, if they don't follow the procedure as they're supposed to, they could forge these supposedly uh, mathematical proofs. And in general, it just wasn't ready for integration. Now, eventually, this technique was launched uh, in the form of zero cash. Um, however, zero cash has a, uh, another problem, which is revealed by this launch, which is that it's not compatible with smart contracts. So zero cash actually has two different kinds of transaction in it, Bitcoin-style transactions, because it's a modified version of Bitcoin, and uh, the zero knowledge-based transactions. So then 2016, uh, we launch uh, Corda to the public. Corda is R3's distributed ledger technology. Corda introduces some more innovations in the privacy space. The big one, which we have talked about the most so far, is that uh, in Corda, we don't send all data to everyone. In all prior existing blockchain systems, they had a notion of global broadcast, where every financial transaction is relayed via a kind of gossip network uh, to every participant in the system. But in Corda, Programmers are expected to specify explicitly which parties on the network should hear about a transaction at, the, and at which times. And it can do this because every party has a verified identity uh, on the network. We also have confidential identities. This is the same concept as Bitcoin, where um, identities are randomized, but with significant uh, additional infrastructure on top to make it easy for developers to work with and to handle the logistics of key management for you. So this makes the entire process transparent to the developer with the anonymization and de-anonymization of transactions happening automatically depending on context, but developers don't have to think about it. So that's useful. And then we have transaction tear-offs, which allow you to partially reveal the contents of a transaction for signing and other purposes. And these are good. These are techniques based on years of experience with Bitcoin because um, I was the lead platform engineer uh, well, I am the lead platform engineer of Corda, sorry, and I was the lead developer of Bitcoin J, which is a very widely used Bitcoin library uh, for building applications. But, you know, it's still not perfect. Even though transaction data is anonymized and partial, nonetheless, some fields in transactions are still visible some of the time to some parties. This is a privacy model which is clearly better than what came before, but it's still very difficult to reason about. It's not it's not completely perfect. You can't say for sure what can be seen when and by who uh, in a convincing way. And so we knew this would be a problem right from the start. And on my first days when I joined R3, I sat down with 
Richard and James and Todd and, and the other people at R3. And I said, look, we need to have a solution to this problem that's simple and easy to understand and is compatible with smart contracts and is transparent for the developer. And that means we need to think about the world of video games and we need to take technology from the world of video games. So you can imagine how well that went down. Now, what relevance, what possible relevance do video games have to the world of financial transactions? Well, so it turns out that uh, you know, every games console, uh, like this uh, beautiful Xbox One you can see on the screen here, every games console has uh, tamper-proof electronics inside, uh, which does a lot of complex things like encryption of memory. Um, and it does these things because video games consoles, these modern consoles, they create shared multiplayer worlds in which players compete with each other to win games. And not knowing everything about the game or the other players is a key part of those games. Now, if you could violate the privacy of other players, uh, as has been done, for example, in this game running on a PC, this is a wall hack, it's, it's a modification of the game that lets you see through walls, then of course you could, uh, you could uh, get an advantage over the other players and obtain an advantage which would let you win every game. Now, of course, I think you can see where I'm going with this. The analogy here is straightforward. Capitalism is a shared multiplayer game in which different players compete in the market, right, or they're collaborating in a shared multiplayer world, which is the shared ledger. And the privacy they need uh, is essential for that competition to work correctly. And if they could obtain private information about other players, then they could outcompete them and always win. So what do we want? We want a shared multiplayer space, which is the global ledger, and that's what Corda creates. And we don't want a single super authority. This, this sort of privacy problem is fairly easy to solve if you pick a single entity that knows everything. And then whenever you want to know something about what's happening in this multiplayer space, you just send a message to the super authority and say, what's happening? And the authority looks up who you are and it figures out what you should be able to see and sends you back the answer. You can do that kind of thing for some sorts of video games. But the reason that uh, games consoles uh, don't always do that, they, they have a variety of, you know, uh, like I said, the tamper-proof electronics is for performance reasons, you need to be able to spin around quickly and see if there's a player behind you quicker than um, the server can react. So uh, the, the machine itself ends up knowing more about what's happening in this game than you do. And this is the key distinction that we're introducing here. Right? It becomes possible when you have this kind of electronics to share data with your counterparty's computer, but not with them. Now, I want to stress that because it's not intuitive. It's not how things work today. Today, if you send a message to someone's computer, it is the same thing as sending it to them. But in this world we're heading into now, you can send data to a counterparty's computer such that they can process it, but the processing is limited, and it's not the same thing as sending it to those people. They cannot see the full message that you send to their computer. They can only see the outcome of some computation. And to do that, I need to know that their computer, the counterparty's computer, will protect the data I'm sending against the actual physical owner of the device, even if they open it up. Okay? And if we had that, right, and if then they were able to check that what the software there was running, and if we had this, then it would allow us to run smart contracts against transactions that you can't see the details of to check the rules of the ledger are being followed, and that would give you uh, integrity of the ledger, which is what matters to us, of course. We must know that the, the numbers add up, but also privacy. Now, this technology to, has previously been available only in games consoles, but that has started changing. And what we want as a result is Intel SGX. Intel is, of course, an investor in R3. And they're not only an investor, they're a technology provider as well. SGX is a software guard extensions. It's a set of new CPU instructions in silicon, uh, Skylake plus silicon, so these chips have been shipping since the end of 2015, which enable you to get console-like electronic security, uh, but on regular PC hardware. Now, the way this works is fairly simple. Every chip being manufactured that has this feature contains a unique key, a cryptographic key, which uh, is used to not only encrypt memory and other things, but also sign reports saying what the chip is doing. Now, the key is installed at the factory at manufacturing time. Modern silicon manufacturing is a very difficult thing. It can only be done in very specialized plants, like this uh, Intel D1X facility you see in the video. 
And at the factory, the key is installed in, in the chip, and then the key is itself signed by a master key, which is, is also stored in, securely in the factory. And in this way, the chip can prove to you what it's doing over the internet by signing statements with the key, which is itself signed by Intel. So there's a chain of custody leading all the way back to the factory. And with these sorts of keys, what the chip can do is create what they call an enclave. An enclave is a shielded part of the hardware in which software can run in a tamper-proof way. An enclave consists of an encrypted memory space and a bunch of other features which allow um, you to load a program inside, and that program can then do computation on private data. It can generate encryption keys that are only available to the enclave. And in this way, you can actually send data to someone's computer without it being available for them. Uh, to them, but nonetheless, they still know what is being done with that data because they inserted the software into the enclave. They just don't have access to the data it's operating on. Now, every security technology has what we call a threat model. A threat model is a listing, it's an enumeration of all the threats that you care about. And you must have a threat model because the world is full of threats. And if you don't decide up front which ones you care about and which ones you don't, then you can rapidly end up Obviously, the intuitive threat model is you care about all threats, but if you do that, you rapidly end up being unable to prioritize, and you end up overwhelmed. Now, the SGX threat model is incredibly strong. It assumes that everything outside the silicon casing is a threat. And that's true even if, uh, for example, you have access to advanced electronics equipment, like uh, the, the focused ion beam workstation, which you see on this screen now. A focused ion beam workstation is a tool that can uh, not only see, uh, but also cut wires that are only a nanometer uh, or so across. So you can, you can resolve individual features of an electronic circuit this way. Nonetheless, SGX is designed on the assumption that everything in the computer uh, is potentially malicious, right? So uh, the CPU is authentic, but for example, uh, this is much stronger than just a warranty sticker, right? We're assuming here that the actual computer itself may have been built in order to cheat. So not only, uh, um, you know, obvious things like the keyboard or the mouse might be malicious, but also things like the memory chips, the graphics card, the network adapter, right? Every piece of electronics outside of the CPU itself is considered to be potentially malicious. That's a very, very, very strong threat model. And it enables us to do new things that like trust someone's computer even if we don't trust them. So SGX can be used for many things. In today's presentation, what I'm telling you about is the way we're using it in Corda for ledger privacy, but it has many other use cases as well. For example, uh, we could use it to protect private keys and we may well do so. Currently, we're not focusing on that because Banks and other institutions already tend to have special hardware called hardware security modules that does this, but we could use SGX too. We could use it for proxy-only oracles. These are entities on a distributed ledger which don't uh, have uh, data which they sign themselves, but they are actually just forwarding requests onto some third party which isn't on the ledger. There's been some research into using SGX uh, in the context of Ethereum of the proxy-only oracle use case. It's not so useful in a system where institutions themselves get involved, but it's possible. Nonetheless, we are using it to tackle privacy. And the way this works is that a chain of custody, so that's the set of financial transactions leading up to, for example, a payment you have received or the latest state of a deal. The chain of custody, all of the, the history of the ledger leading up to that point are being encrypted and passed around the network encrypted. And thus, when if I wish to send you money, and I need to convince you that I am, in fact, the rightful owner of the money I'm sending, then what I can do is encrypt that chain of custody to your enclave, send it to the enclave, you can check it, and you will then know that, you know, you will convince yourself, in effect, that I do, in fact, uh, have this money legitimately, that all of the transactions leading up to that point were correctly signed, don't create money out of nothing, and so on, right? All the other rules we might wish to enforce. And this relies on a process called remote attestation. That's where a, a computer, you know, a, an SGX capable CPU over the internet generates a report uh, which states what software it's running. It has the cryptographic hash of the software that it's running in it, signs it with that key, 
uh, and then provides it to a uh, third party like ourselves. We then check uh, that, that uh, all those signatures hang together and thus we know that, that software is running inside a genuine Intel CPU that came from a genuine factory. Now this wasn't entirely straightforward to do this and um, I want to tell you about, about what we've done and uh, what we're, we're working on, what, let, what remains to be done. So what have we done? Well, so the first problem we faced was that out of the box, an SGX enclave is, is only, uh, can only be written in C or C++. Now, that may not appear to be a particularly interesting problem because, um, you know, these are not particularly obscure languages. Nonetheless, there are two issues. One is that uh, in the financial space, these languages are no longer used that widely outside of a few things like high-frequency trading, because uh, Java and C-sharp have largely displaced them. These are much more productive languages, much safer, much harder to write insecure code in if you're using something like Java. And thus, as a result, many developers in the financial industry either haven't used C++ for decades or never learned it at all. So that's a problem. But the second problem with C++ is it's very insecure. Very, very hard to write secure software in these languages. And SGX, it protects software from tampering, but it's not a magical shield that makes software completely unhackable. If the software itself contains flaws, then those flaws can still be exploited to extract data from the enclave. So you really want the software running inside the enclave to be written in a language which is type safe, doing balance checking, doing all the security checks needed to um, eliminate exploits that frequently crop up in C++ code. And it's a bit harder to do that than you might think, because inside the enclave, uh, you are shielded from the operating system, right? The, the threat model here is very strong. Um, SGX assumes that the operating system, like Linux or Windows, is fully hacked or fully malicious. You're shielded from the operating system, but unfortunately, the operating system is also shielded from you. You don't have any access to the operating system inside the enclave. And that means that you don't have modern conveniences that all developers might expect, like you know, the ability to print to the screen. That's because the operating system mediates access to the hardware. So inside the enclave, you can't write to the screen, you can't use the network, you can't save things to disk. You can only make, you can politely request that the operating system do these things for you, but of course, the operating system is potentially attacker, uh, so you have to be very careful when doing that. So that's a problem. We also face the challenge that SGX was designed on the assumption that you load a program into the enclave and then that's what is reported uh, over the internet as part of remote attestation. But what we want to do is actually a little bit different. We want to load smart contracts into the enclave and run them. So we're loading programs into a program inside the enclave. And this is not a typical use case for which um, SGX was not uh, originally designed. It can do it, right? It's not that they didn't think about this at all. It's just not uh, typically how it's used. And so this required working with Intel in order to ensure that they were satisfied that um, we would not be undermining the security that they've put in place around SGX because to use this feature, your enclave has to be authorized by Intel. Finally, and this was, a, this was one of the big challenges we faced, this whole thing needs to be transparent to developers. Um, there are many, many different use cases that people wish to run on a distributed ledger. That's one of the most interesting things that we've learned um, in the last year and a half uh, while we've been developing Corda in collaboration with the banks, uh, other uh, big financial institutions and so on. There are many, many different use cases. It goes far beyond sending tokens and cash around. And as a result, many of these applications, many of these distributed applications that people want to run on Corda are very complex. We're talking about uh, managing the details of uh, you know, uh, swap life cycles, um, about managing uh, you know, collateral management for liquidity and other things like this. So this is already hard enough. Financial developers are domain experts in finance, but it's not reasonable. It would be completely unreasonable to expect them to also be experts in operating systems or embedded uh, software development or hardware engineering. And writing an enclave is very similar to writing embedded software for you know running a, like the sort of sort of programming you would do if you were programming a car engine, for example. It's very different to the sort of thing they're used to. And this is where previous privacy solutions that people have added to blockchain technologies often stumble. Um, they will announce that, you know, well, we've integrated a zero knowledge proof technology, for example, and, and you know, I, I like these technologies and, and I think they're fascinating and will be very important in future. But one thing they often don't mention is that it's not compatible with smart contracts and therefore you can't uh, take any arbitrary 
distributed app and make it private with those techniques. Right? You can in theory. Right? The theory allows you to do it, but the practicalities of it mean you can't really do that, at least not yet. So it needs to be transparent to developers, uh, almost drop in and automatic. Right? We don't want to have to have them adjust their apps. So how do we overcome these challenges? Well, we started by taking an existing open source Java virtual machine. Now, Java is a programming language, and Java virtual machines are programs that run programs written in Java. Right? Native CPUs, the, the, the electronics that are inside your computer, can't run Java applications directly. They come in a form which is sort of vendor neutral. So the Java programs come in a form which isn't specific to uh, Intel or ARM chips or Qualcomm or whatever. Um, they, they target this virtual computer that doesn't really exist called the Java Virtual Machine. And it must be therefore implemented in software. So we took an existing Java Virtual Machine. And out of the box, these programs uh, don't run inside an enclave because, of course, they expect an operating system. How unreasonable of them. So we took one of these programs and we fused it with a tiny operating system we wrote that provides enough basic services for the JVM to be happy and to start up and run enough functionality for our needs. So having bundled these things together, we now had software that could run inside an enclave. And this is useful because Corda smart contracts are written in a subset of Java. It's not the full language, by the way. But it's a subset of it. And this is very convenient for many developers because this reuses the tools they already know. And it's convenient for us because there's a lot of infrastructure out there for working with this language and with this technology that it doesn't really make sense to reinvent. It's, Java is not so far from what you need that you should begin all over again from scratch. It's easier to take it and modify it. So this is not the same thing as Java completely. It's a subset of it. This subsetting is a very frequently used technique in the Java world. And as a result, as a consequence, if you've been paying attention, what you may have noticed is that not only is SGX useful for many things in finance, of course it could be used for many other things in, across the whole industry, across the whole software industry. And this, this sort of technology, this fusing of a secure, developer-friendly technology like Java with the privacy of SGX, this has applications far beyond Corda. It has applications far beyond distributed ledgers, really far beyond finance. This is a technology that will end up Potentially, whether it's done by us or by others, this sort of approach will end up making a big difference to our whole society. Now, we're the first people to do this, and we know we're the first people to do this because along the way, uh, we encountered uh, uh, we, we, we were we encountered uh, issues in the in the software that comes with SGX that showed that no one had attempted to run a JVM inside an enclave before. Fortunately, um, Intel software is itself open source, just like Corda is. And as a result, we were able to immediately establish a working relationship with Intel's engineering teams, who were fantastic to work with. We were able to make changes and submit them back to Intel. This is a, what you see on the screen here is an example of one of the changes we made. And as part of this project, we flew out to Portland. Uh, myself, James, and Richard, we flew out to Portland and spent a couple of days with the SGX engineering team, getting to know them, um, hearing about what they were working on, they were fantastic hosts, and I would love to go back uh, and chat to them again sometime because these are my kind of people, very competent. We, we very much enjoyed working with these people. It was also super convenient that we could just dive in and start improving their software a little bit. We had to add a few features here or there. Um, now, I want to emphasize at this point that this has been our plan since day one, even though we're only talking about it now after we've, we've, we've done a lot of prototyping and we've, we've de-risked this a fair bit. Corda was designed for SGX from day one. And the reason is um, that we knew we would need to do this. right? We knew that other people's plans weren't going to pan out, uh, and we knew that we needed something different. So as an example of this, one design decision that shows this is uh, the fact that we use the, uh, you know, air quotes, traditional Nakamoto uh, ledger model, where the ledger consists of a set of unspent transaction outputs. This UTXO model, as it came to be called, uh, is where you see the ledger as a set of unchanging database entries. And to change the database means um, deleting or marking is used one entry and then adding another. Um, this is different, in fact. Uh, we, the reason we say this is traditional uh, this is a, obviously how blockchain technology started. The reason we highlight this is that uh, many projects in this space are actually derived from Ethereum, or they're just copies of Ethereum. 
And uh, Ethereum uh, uses a very different way of looking at the ledger, in which the ledger is not a set of small immutable data structures, but a sort of simulation of a global virtual computer. And a smart contract in the uh, Ethereum model is actually a full-blown program with memory uh, that you can um, send messages and interact with as if it was a, an online service. But our smart contracts are different. They are just functions that yield a yes or a no for a, a transaction. They define whether a transaction is valid or not, but they, they are not active, alive entities like they are in the Ethereum space. And for a variety of boring technical reasons I won't get into here, um, this uh, fits easier. It, it makes it simpler to implement um, SGX on top of a system in a drop-in way such that uh, it's transparent for developers. Now, the reason we're only talking about this um, now is because uh, this is, of course, a bleeding edge research and development. Um, as, as you saw in the last slide, you know, we actually tweaked the SGX software itself um, this was a new area for both uh, us and Intel. We're one of the first companies to be using SGX. Nonetheless, um, it has worked out very well. Uh, Intel have been great partners. The project is now de-risked, and an uh, agreement with Intel on the security and the code loading aspects of this has been reached. And we are, in fact, looking at more ways to collaborate with Intel in future. Not everything has been implemented. Some work remains. For example, some of the remote attestation code needs to be implemented. We need to integrate it with the uh, Corda resolution flows, and there are some tools around auditing, for example, to make sure that you know the uh, tools that check that uh, no um, funny games or backdoors have been inserted during the development process need to be written, so people can easily convince themselves that this technology does what we claim it does. So there's more to come. Nonetheless, uh, we're excited to tell you about this uh, this new direction for us and uh, watch this space for further developments. Thank you very much.